we come now to reflect upon God's word, will you join me in prayer as we prepare for that celebration of this word? Let us pray. Lord, grant us grace as we look to your word, as we study this gospel, as we share it together, as we consider its meaning and consider our meaning because of it. Lord, take my words and use them to bless all of us and to be a blessing in your name, to bring you glory and praise now and forever. This in Christ we pray. Amen. Now it's not just a Newfie saying or a Cape Breton saying or a South Shore Nova Scotian saying or a PEI saying or a Miramichi saying or an Olive New Brunswick saying or an Atlantic Canadian saying alone. Because I'm sure there's lots of people out there I have been asked the question, when you come into a new place, when you come to meet people you've never met before, one of the first things, the sort of things that's always asked of you is, where's you from? Who's your father now? Now, if someone throws in something like, me duck eat, or me love, then yeah, maybe that's from Newfoundland. Or me dear, or hey boy, that might be Cape Breton. Or around here. Well, when people ask, this, when they're trying to, to get to know you, you, it's an opportunity to get welcomed in because once they can find that point of origin, that place where they can link their story to yours, does that ever do a lot to help people put you into context and to help you put them into some kind of context and gets us all a chance to know each other just a little bit better? Doesn't it seem? So if you're trying to find, to get to know someone, I mean, finding out who their family is, where they were born, a lot of that can be fairly useful, but not determinate. It doesn't tell everything. When the Gospel writer Matthew sat down to write his Gospel, he was teaching about the life of Jesus. And he tells the story about where Jesus was from, his family and the places. He makes special points to show this parentage and the origin account was not just about knowing Jesus as a person, but seeing those connections, those very important, especially legalistic connections of how Jesus is also the Messiah. This is laying the foundations, showing that God fulfills his promises in all of time, that the prophets are fulfilled in Jesus, who you are really about to hear about. Now that you know who his father is and his father's father, and so on. And you know where he's from. One of the things I really enjoy about living in this region is that when people ask me where I am from and who my parents are, many people know or quickly make connections on who my parents are. And a few times, we might even find out we're related or from similar places. Like I say, that, gets, that makes getting to know each other pretty easy. But of course, on the other side of things, I, one of the things I just can't stand living in this region is that when people ask me where I'm from and who my parents and my family are, many people already know or make quick connections and a few times we discover we're related or from similar places and all kinds of assumptions get made. And the assumptions can make getting to really know each other harder. See, it's both. While we live in an age where we seek to, to claim that we are something that's independent from our breeding and from our past culture, that we are self-defined, self-realized people, the fact remains that who we are and who people will accept us to be still has an awful lot to do with our roots. Though it doesn't have to be ruled by the roots by any means. It's, we can't deny that those connections have meaning for them as well as us. Where's Jesus from? Well, his folks, well, they come from the Nazareth, Galilee area, but they're really from Bethlehem. That's the family roots. That's the family tree is back in the, in the land of Bethlehem. But, you know, in the story, they were from Egypt for a bit, and that was for some really harsh reasons, but they do make their way back to Nazareth again, so... I guess they're Nazarenes, but they're a bit Egyptian, and they've got roots in Bethlehem. And who's his father now? Well, let me introduce you to Joseph. Joseph the carpenter, Joseph the, the 
the one who's also of a line of David, as is outlined in the beginning of Matthew, which gives Jesus a legal status as Mary's, Mary, Joseph's wife's son. But he's not really dad in the terms of the normal way a dad is a dad, but he's still fathering Jesus. Look, I hope you're sitting down. Sometime before Jesus was born, his mother had an angelic vision and was told by the angel in the vision that she would have a child and it would be a boy, a boy born by the Holy Spirit. So Joseph is Jesus' father and God is also Jesus' father, but Jesus is also God. And to add to that, the Gospels provide us on this, not just one, but two lineages for Jesus, one in the Gospel of Matthew, one in the Gospel of Luke, and they're both attributed to Joseph, but one might be the lineage of Mary. But neither clearly indicates that. And both lineages lead back to David, but one shows the line from David through Solomon to Jesus, and the other one is David through the younger brother of Solomon, Nathan, not the prophet, but the son of David, Nathan, to Jesus. That's the one in Luke. So, whether you look at the legal standard or what was actually the factual standard, Jesus is of a line of David, and a human heir as well as, well as the heir by being God, God's begotten, to the throne of David. And that's the fulfillment of that dynasty in him. And even though Joseph and Mary were settled Nazarenes through the movement of worldly political powers in their, their world shifted so that words that had been said about this Messiah, this inheritor of the throne of David, would be fulfilled. So they ended up in little old Bethlehem for Jesus' birth because that is the place that is none of the least of all the sons of Judah. And just so someone could count them, that was just so someone could go, oh, Mary Joseph, going to be another, huh? And they were counted there because of their status, their status of being of the line of David, the tribe of Benjamin. However, of all these traditions, traditional means of establishing the importance of the kingship of Jesus, there were some kings, magi, from far off countries, or counties anyway, that were prominent stargazers. Perhaps Persia was very good at gazing at stars through its Zoroastrian connections, but also in the general interest. That was a societal interest in the stars in the sky. Ethiopia was also known to, to gaze at the stars and to wonder about them and the astral phenomena, and India as well. That was part of, of their not just religious culture, but their general culture. But for many scholars, thinking that the, the kings were following a Zoroastrian astrology to notice this alignment, this formation, this moment of the star over Jerusalem, over Israel. Portray these magi in more of the Persian light, Babylonian light. But let's not forget, let's not forget who was, who was taken into, into exile in Babylon, who was who became a teacher in Babylon and stayed in Babylon even though the rest uh, or many of the other Jews went back to rebuild Jerusalem. These could have been those who were readers of Daniel, later students of Daniel, who stayed, who studied with the people of Babylon and Persia and who worked as a teacher in the courts of the royalty there. Leaves us to wonder. Anyway, these magi st studying the sky shared a common vision about the star and it was of great importance of them for whatever reason to go and celebrate the king of the Jews. Their vision of Christ came from their studies, from their logic and their understanding. Yes, logic and understanding can lead one to Christ. 
Don't ever diminish that. And these wise men came to the court of King Herod. Because logic and reason, if you're going to look for a king somewhere, let's go to the palace. See, logic and reason can't get you everywhere sometimes. And they came to the king following the star. It was in the right lineup, but the star went further. But Herod interceded. He wanted to know how the, 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 this king of the Jews that wasn't him was born, wasn't of his family, was born. But Herod was king appointed through foreign powers, through the manipulation of a family line of priests, a dubious king at best, yet not ignorant of what it might take to be considered legitimate. And what a threat prophecy was. And these foreign powers and their acclamation of perhaps another. And the traditional line of David. What this all meant of his grasp for power. So much of why Herod and his family built the temples, built the palaces, was to build up legitimacy. And here were three foreign kings, wise men, counselors who came and were messing up the whole plan. When one grasps for power, one often squeezes too hard, only to have it slip through their fingers. Or as my old psychology text quoted from a pioneer of psychology and philosophy, Eric Fromm, who said, the lust for power is not rooted in strength, but in weakness. And in his terrific weakness, he turned a horrific event of the past into the prophetic text of his own kingship. Herod's evil rooted in a stand made against the will of God turned Jeremiah's words, the words of this prophet, as he sought to offer love and hope, he turned it and soured it and recreated the suffering of the Babylonian exile and the, one of the darkest moments of Israelite history in his persecution of innocent children in the region of Bethlehem or Ramah. And this being the same region that Hannah and her son Samuel, Samuel whose story we read today in his call, where her son Samuel were from, where prayers were made to God for the birth of children both by Hannah and by Rachel. These children who gave their lives meaning and all of this soured by a selfish king who killed the children. So in the light of all this, in the light of all this story, of all these accounts, of all of this history, what does this have to say about who you are? You know, there is something really wonderful about the Christian faith community and in its praise and in its study and even in its time when we struggle, struggle together, but struggle with God's word together. We still have this will to gather and to understand together. And we spend our whole lives looking in all sorts of places. We look in our families and our careers and our community into our identity as, as a nation, as a nationality for answers that God is giving us. How does all of this history of Christ and this living out of a life in Christ, how does all of this, who we are, where we come from, how does this give us an understanding, not just of self, but more than that, of God? What Jesus offers, and what the wise men really came to celebrate, what shepherds ran from the fields to discover is the Messiah. The salvation of God by God for all humankind. God is your father. Christ is your brother and the Holy Spirit is what holds all of us in the fellowship of the love offered in Christ. As God once moved the cosmos to set the marker in the sky to show the way he has through the journey you have taken and the journey that you are on called you to be something for others who are looking who are looking for the Messiah, 
were looking for salvation. They looked to you as they looked to the stars, or they looked to you as they looked to a king in a land that could have shown them grace and rejoiced with them as he falsely said he would. But these people don't come with falseness in their hearts, but with falseness in the world around them that would lead them astray, that would cause them to curse the Christ that they are seeking, to taint the salvation that they're offered. They're seeking God. And you know, as God has offered Christ, so Christ has called us all to be in him lights unto others, to show them and guide them in this way. To show them where they're from. To show them to whom they belong, where their family is and where their family will always be. Here. Right where you are. Where we are. Here, everywhere. And let us be that family that celebrates our Father in heaven, that knows that heaven is our home, and we're going home. God bless you all.